Schwartz from Joseph Rennie Unitas.com and today I have the pleasure to meet Joseph Rennie himself. Hi Joe, how uh, are you doing? Very good. Well, um, the basic inspiration is everyday experiences. Uh, some of them, you know, very light. You wake up, sun is shining, you feel good. Some of them very deep, you know, love, a loss, a tragedy, things that you read about far away, things that happen right in your own house, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I guess once it gets turned into music, as it's starting to get turned into music, I'm influenced by the composers that I've studied my whole life that I think are really brilliant at creating music to tell a story and to elicit feelings from the audience. Um, you know, I was just, you mentioned, uh, you know, Unstoppable. If you really look at that, you know, it's, it's a little play on suspended triads yeah. and moving bass lines. Same with this. Just in a different arrangement. So I get fascinated by harmonic situations that are more modern uh, than, um, than let's say in the going back two or 300 years and, and uh, in Western music. And uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm interested in simplicity and elegance that goes right to a person's heart, you know, and gives them a great feeling. And so I kind of play around with things, you know, like with, if you were looking at these chords, you might think, well, these are really strange guitar chords, you know. They're not your normal major, minor, seventh, yeah, you know, course. kind of chords. They're not power chords either. But the bass line I use is a very simple bass line that's been used for hundreds of years and it really does make people feel good. So I'm, I'm usually, I'm looking at, at elements that get me to first base, as if I use a, an American yeah. expression. And then I say, what can I do to make it so interesting and that no one else has ever tried before? And so I take harmonic structures that are very modern things that I've learned uh, that started maybe a uh, uh, hundred years ago and mm. up to the present and then I start to use sounds that are very modern and uh, it's it's my way of enjoying playing with the elements of music and being able to tell someone a story. Well it's wonderful I mean uh, we've had a few times in in our career going all the way back to 88 where we've done a lot of shows in France and, and uh, sometimes it shifts where we're doing more shows in the UK or in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly we do an enormous amount in North America, yeah. uh, South America and Asia. Um, but um, you know France is very special to me because when we started um, touring, when I started out as a solo artist, the first tour that we ever had of Europe had only three real shows on it. One was the Marquee Club in London, one was mm -hmm. the Montreux Jazz Festival, and the other was the in Paris right. at the Theatre Montmartre. And, and uh, that was the beginning of my relationship with promoter Gerard Giraud, who was always taking care of us here in France. And uh, it's a great, it's, you know, it's very important for musicians out there to understand that their relationship with the agents and promoters is extremely important. You know, the agent goes out and and represents you uh, at home and abroad to find uh, gigs, but it's the promoter who takes the risk to bring you over. And it's a significant risk, but without mm. really good promoters who love music and but who understand business, so the musician would get nowhere. Mm. And so, um, Gerard has, has uh, been a fantastic uh, asset in introducing me to the French public and doing it in a way that has allowed our audience to grow, which is very important. And then he's, he's along the way, he's turned into a very close friend and, and uh, we love him very much. <laughs> Uh, no, we haven't really thought about that yet. Um, you know, we started this tour over a year ago, 
and we took a break so um, uh, the aristocrats could continue. Mike mm -hmm. Keneally had some work to do. Um, I was going to be recording a chicken foot album. So we had other things that we had to do. I had to finish my book and whatnot. And then we started up about a month ago and we are going to go all the way until December. So um, we're, we'll maybe in a month or so we'll start thinking about DVD, but we haven't really thought about that yet. Oh, um, well, it's a real American thing. Um, when you grow up in America, when I was growing up, everybody came from somewhere else. Their parents, you know, Romania, France, Italy, Germany, everybody had a name that sounded like it came from somewhere else, yeah. right? And so everybody quickly changed their name to a nickname okay. among friends. Okay. And, uh, you know, so uh, Budheimer would be Buddy and Satriani would be Satch and so uh, on and so forth, okay. you know. Um, that just was one of those things uh, that is the strange culture of America in the, in the 20th century. That's funny. Uh, because it, there was a real push to be uh, American. And no one really knew what that was, but they knew that it wasn't old world Europe. And, and it had to be something new. So uh, my grandparents came from Italy and, and landed in New York around 1907. Yeah. And they raised... Uh, my parents to be as American as possible not to speak Italian you know or yeah. not to speak English with an Italian accent yeah. and so when my sisters and brothers w were born uh, along with me it was again the same thing to sound as much like you came from New York as possible okay. with very little connection to the Italian speaking uh, family uh, it's very different now where in America people really sort of celebrate their ancestry mm. a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, but that was back uh, in the days when uh, the Americans were crazy, they were afraid of communists and all sorts of things. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so anyway, that's how Satch came about. Yeah, that was just a nickname. Well, the best thing you can ever have in your corner is a great band, I gotta say that. You have to have a great band. If a band always makes you feel like there's room for you to play perfectly or to improvise, then you, you, there's no tension, you know what I mean? And then you can really focus on the moment and, and the audience. It's very important. I always thought it's really important that when you're putting on a rock and roll show, it's not a presentation. It is an event that's happening once in a lifetime for the people that have come this one time, you know, mm. no matter where you're playing. And so in order to do that, you have to kind of be part of the event. So that might mean that the parts, you know, have to be simplified. Maybe there's a part where you play twice as hard, mm. twice as many notes, because there are people that are making you feel so excited. And um, your band has to understand that and they have to learn to go with that. Mm. I think that's the most important thing. Other than that, it's the obvious. You do have to practice. That's why I'm doing the interview, but I'm also noodling around here because I didn't play my guitar yesterday, and so I want to make sure I'm properly warmed up for tonight's show. <laughs> I think um, over the years, um, success um, brought me the ability to understand live performance a lot better. When, before Not of This Earth, I always wondered why, when I performed, that I could only show people maybe 40% of what I could do. And I couldn't figure that out. Like, what what would happen on stage where I'd get so excited or, or, or nervous or tense? And at the end of the show, I think they never saw the real Joe Satriani play. They just saw some reduced version, you know? Yeah. And I thought, well, it must be something that I'm not doing. And I didn't really um, understand that until I think in 1988 when I was touring with two entities. I was beginning to tour as Joe Satriani, the solo artist, which was brand new. And I really wasn't quite sure, like, should I run around a lot? Yeah. You know, should I stand absolutely still when I play? You know, should there be lights moving around? Yeah. You know, it's like, is it jazz? Is it fusion? Is it rock? Is it metal? What is it? You know, um, 
but also that year I played with Mick Jagger and that was a really great uh, break from trying to be a solo artist. Mm. And so I was a solo artist for three weeks in January of 88 and then immediately was one of nine people in the Mick Jagger band. Yeah. And I could relax a little bit, you know what I mean? I could, yeah. Because Mick Jagger was there and he was running around being the greatest rock and roll entertainer ever. Yeah. And there was another guitarist and a keyboard player and a horn player, you know what I mean? And background singer. So I started to understand that there was a place to be yourself. And, and uh, Mick Jagger was always telling me just be yourself just walk out there and you know give everyone the best show possible but that means that you have to be Joe don't worry about trying to be Keith or Mick Taylor or anybody like that just be yourself and so when I got off the first Jagger tour and went back to doing the solo work with with uh, Stu Ham and Jonathan Mover I had a new sense of uh, how I was going to show people all that I could do and, and that year w was very important for the development of bringing the album, Surfing with the Alien, Not of the Surf, mm -hmm. to the people. Because I knew how to do it in the studio. I just yeah. hadn't figured out to do it, how to do it live and make it fun to look at, you know. Because I could stand there and play the whole record, you know, note for note, but that's not really exciting, you yeah. know. So, and I, I learned a lot of that from Mick and how he would take the Rolling Stone songs and his own material and, and make it work live but not change himself, you know what I mean? He would stay true to himself. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was great to see him do that. It gave me a lot of faith in, in rock and roll. <laughs>
I'm thinking it would be great to write new music knowing that Mark O'Brien and Mike are going to play it and to capitalize on what we sound like live. So uh, those are the things I have left to work on. And I'll get to them um, at the beginning of next year. Right now we're working out a schedule where Mike Keneally records his solo album, the Aristocrats yeah. record their solo album. Yeah. Um, there's the Chicken Foot album and my solo album. So right now we're just kind of moving schedules around to make sure there's enough time for everybody. Well, it should be the original lineup. Um, nice. I've you know I've seen Chad and and uh, and did a show with uh, Sammy not too long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, um, in San Francisco, and everyone's sort of ready to do something. Mm. Um, but we all have, you know, there's my touring schedule, there's uh, Chad's uh, writing and recording with the Chili Peppers right now. Yeah. And uh, Sam is actually uh, on tour all summer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, we're, you know, I'm thinking if we're lucky by the end of the year, we can go in and record. We've got songs already, yeah, yeah. enough for an album. And uh, it's just a question of what everyone feels like recording first. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So 2015 will be pretty productive, I think. <laughs> Maybe 2015. Yeah. Yeah. We have been talking to so a few players. Yeah. Um, yeah, because everyone's busy for the rest of this year, and maybe the second half of 2015 would see us, but we would probably start in the U.S. because we haven't done a U.S. G3 mm. in a long mm. time. Mm. So um, we would start there, and, and yeah. But I can't tell you who yet. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Satch, to, uh, to have answered my questions. And uh, I wish you a great show tonight thank in you. C4. And, uh, and see you next time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> That's a neat, just in case. <laughs>